Thank you. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really cool to be here at Booksmith, the, the great bookstore. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, from the first chapter. I'm going to read actually the whole first chapter. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how the book was written. And then I'm happy to have uh, kind of a really informal discussion, conversation, questions with you guys about anything that has to do with the book or with my journalism or with soccer or politics or the weather or whatever you'd like. Um, I do find there's a weird thing that happens when you're talking about a book or it's, it happens when you're writing, especially when you're really in the thick of things, that it does feel like everything in your life pertains to the book, uh, which is why we can talk about all those other things and they, I, I'm sure I'll find a way to relate it back. <laughs> okay. During the war, which Nelson's father called The Anxious Years, a few radical students at the conservatory founded a theater company. They read the French surrealists and improvised adaptations of Quechua myths. They smoked cheap tobacco and sang protest songs with vulgar lyrics. They laughed in public as if it were a political act, baring their teeth and frightening children. Their ranks were drawn, broadly speaking, from the following overlapping circles of youth. The long hairs, the working class, the sex crazed, the posers, the provincials, the alcoholics, the emotionally needy, the rabble-rousers, the opportunists, the punks, the hangers-on, and the obsessed. Nelson was just a boy then, moody, thoughtful, growing up in a suburb of the capital with his head bent over a book. He was secretly in love with a slight brown-haired girl from school with whom he'd exchanged actual words on only a handful of occasions. At night, Nelson imagined the dialogues they would have one day, he and this wayfish, perfectly ordinary girl whom he loved. Sometimes, he would act these out for his brother, Francisco, Neither had ever been to the theater. The company, named Diciembre, coalesced around the work of a few strident, though novice, playwrights and quickly became known for their daring trips into the conflict zone, where they lived out their slogan, Theater for the People, at no small risk to the physical safety of the actors. Such was the tenor of the era that while sacrifices of this sort were applauded by certain sectors of the public, many others condemned them and even equated them with terrorism. In 1983, when Nelson was only five, a few of Diciembre's members were harassed by police in the town of Belen, a relatively minor affair, which nonetheless made the papers prelude to a more serious case in Las Velas, where members of the local defense committee I'm sorry, where members of the local defense committee briefly held three actors captive, even roughed them up a bit, believing them to be Cuban agents. The trio had adapted a short story by Alejo Carpentier, quite convincingly by all accounts. Nor were they entirely safe in the city. In early April 1986, after two performances of a piece titled The Idiot President, Diciembre's lead actor and playwright was arrested for incitement and left to languish for the better part of a year at a prison known as Collectors. His name was Henry Nunez, and his freedom was for a brief time a cause celeb. Letters were written on his behalf in a handful of foreign countries by mostly well-meaning people who never heard of him before and who had no opinion about his work. Somewhere in the archives of one or another of the national radio stations lurks the audio of a jailhouse interview. This serious young man, liberally sprinkling his statements with citations of Camus and UNESCO, describing a prison production of the idiot president with inmates in all the starring roles. Criminals and delinquents have an intuitive understanding of a play about national politics, Henry said in a firm, uncowed voice. Nelson, a month shy of his... Sorry. Nelson, a month shy of his eighth birthday, chanced to hear this interview. His father, Sebastian, stood at the kitchen counter preparing coffee with a look of concern. Dad, young Nelson asked, what's a playwright? Sebastian thought for a moment. He wanted to be a writer when he was his son's age. A storyteller, he said. A playwright is someone who makes up stories. The boy was intrigued but not satisfied with this definition. That evening, he brought it up with his brother, Francisco, who responded the way he always did to almost anything Nelson said aloud, with a look of puzzlement and annoyance, as if there were a set of normal things that all younger brothers knew instinctively to do in the presence of their elders, but which Nelson had never learned. Francisco fiddled with the radio and sighed. Playwrights make up conversation. They call them scripts. That crap you write about your little fake girlfriend for example. <laughs> Francisco was 12, an age at which all was forgiven. Eventually he would leave for the United States, but long before his departure he was already living as if he were gone, as if this family of his, mother, father, and brother, mattered hardly at all. He knew exactly how to end conversations. No recordings of the aforementioned prison performance of the idiot president have ever been found. <laughs> 
By the time of his release in November of that same year, Henry was much thinner and older. He no longer spoke with that firm voice. In fact, he hardly spoke at all. He gave no interviews. In January, in response to an uprising by inmates, two of the more volatile sections of collectors were raised, bombed and burned by the army, and the men who made up the cast of the idiot president died in the assault. Mm. They were shot in the head or killed by shrapnel. Some had the misfortune to be crushed beneath falling concrete walls. In all, 343 inmates died, vanished, and though Henry wasn't there, part of him died that day too. The incident garnered international attention, a few letters of protest from European capitals, and then it was forgotten. Henry lost Rogelio, his best friend and cellmate, his lover, though he wouldn't have used that word at that time, not even to himself. He did not take the stage again for nearly 15 years. But a troop must be bigger than a single personality. The Siemita responded to the curfew, the bombings, and the widespread fear with a program of drama-based bacchanals so drunk on youth and art they might as well have been living in another universe. Gunshots were deliberately misheard, interpreted as celebratory fireworks, and used as a pretext to praise the local joie de vivre. Blackouts put them in the mood for romance. In its glory days at the end of the 1980s, December felt less like a theater collective and more like a movement. They staged marathon all-night shows in the newly abandoned buildings and warehouses at the edges of the old city. When there was no electricity, which was often, they rigged up lights from car batteries or set candles about the stage. Barring that, they performed in the dark, the spectral voices of the actors emerging from the limitless black. They became known for their pop reworkings of Garcia Lorca, their stentorian readings of Brazilian soap opera scripts, their poetry nights that mocked the very idea of poetry. They celebrated on principle anything that kept audiences awake and laughing through what might have otherwise been the long and lonely hours of curfew. These shows were mythologized by theater students of Nelson's generation, and if one searched, as Nelson had, through the stands of used books and magazines clogging the side streets of the old city, it was possible to find mimeographed copies of the Siemens programs, wrinkled and faded, but bearing that unmistakable whiff of history, the kind one wishes to have been a part of. By the time Nelson entered the conservatory in 1995, the war had been over for a few years, but was still a fresh memory. Much of the capital was being rebuilt. Perhaps it is more correct to say the capital was being reimagined as a version of itself where all that unpleasant recent history had never occurred. There were no statues to the dead, no streets renamed in their honor, no museum of historical memory. Rubble was cleared away, avenues widened, trees planted, new neighborhoods erected atop the ashes of those leveled in the conflict. Shopping malls were planned for every district of the capital and the old city, never an area with exact boundaries, but a commonly employed shorthand referring to the neglected and ruined center of town was restored, block by block, with an optimistic eye towards a UNESCO World Heritage designation. Traffic was rerouted to make it more walkable, dreary facades given a dash of color, and the local pickpockets sent to work the outskirts by a suddenly vigilant police force. Tourists began to return, and the government, at least, was happy. Meanwhile, the Siembre's legend had only grown. Many of Nelson's classmates at the conservatory claimed to have been present at one or another of these historic performances as children. They said their parents had taken them, that they had witnessed unspeakable acts of depravity and unholy union between recital and insurrection, sex and barbarism, that they remained, however many years later, unsettled, scarred, and even inspired by the memory. They were all liars. They were, in fact, studying to be liars. One imagines that students at the conservatory these days speak of other things. They are too young to remember how ordinary fear was during the anxious years. Perhaps they find it difficult to imagine a time when the line of dialogue delivered with a chilling sense of dread did not even require acting. But then, such are the narcotic effects of peace, and certainly no one wants to go backward. Nearly a decade after the war's nominal end, the Siembre still functioned as a loose grouping of actors who occasionally even put on a show often in a private home, to which the audience came by invitation only. Paradoxically, now that travel outside the city was relatively safe, they hardly ever went to the interior. This might have been laziness, a reasonable response to the end of hostilities, or simply middle age, blunting the sharp edge of youthful radicalism. Henry Nunez, once the star playwright of the troupe, all but withdrew from it, attributing the decision not to his time in prison, but to the birth of his daughter. After his prison home was raised, Almost in spite of himself, he fell in love, married, and had a daughter named Anna. And then, life, domesticity, responsibilities. Before Diciembre consumed him, he'd studied biology, enough to qualify for a teaching position at a supposedly progressive elementary school in the cantonment. 
the work appealed to his ego. He could talk for hours about almost anything that came to his mind, and his students would not complain. In his hands, biology was less a science than an obsessive branch of the humanities. The world could, in fact, be explained, and he found it miraculous that his students listened. For extra money, he drove a taxi every other weekend, crossing the city end to end in a serviceable old Chevrolet he'd inherited from his father, though he hadn't been inside a church since the mid-1980s. He put a bright red Jesus Loves You sticker in the front window to make potential passengers feel at ease. <laughs> it was therapeutic, this mindless driving. The blank, sometimes dreary streets were so familiar that they could not surprise him. On good days, he could avoid thinking about his life. Henry kept the giant plush teddy bear in the trunk, bringing it out for his daughter to sit with whenever he picked her up from her mother's house. The bigger she grew, Henry told me, the more his ambition dulled. Not that he blamed her, quite the contrary. Anna, he explained, had saved him from a mediocre sort of life his old friends had suffered to attain. Painters, actors, photographers, poets. Collectively, they are known as artists, just as those men and women who train in spaceflight are known as astronauts, whether or not they have been to space. He preferred not to play the part, he said. He was done pretending, a conclusion he'd come to in the aftermath of his imprisonment after his friends had been killed. But in late 2000, some veterans of the Siembre decided it was important to commemorate the founding of the troop. A series of shows was planned in the city, and a Siembre veteran named Pata Larga even suggested a tour. Naturally, they called on Henry, who with some reluctance agreed to participate, but only if a new actor could be found to join. Auditions for a touring version of The Idiot President were announced for February 2001, and Nelson, a year out of the conservatory at the time, signed up eagerly. He and dozens of young actors just like him more notable for their enthusiasm than for their talent, gathered in the damp school gymnasium in the district of Legon, reading lines that no one had said aloud in more than a decade. It was like stepping back in time, Henry thought, and this had been precisely his concern when the proposal was first floated. He sighed, perhaps too loudly. He felt old. Since his divorce, he saw 11-year-old Anna on alternate weekends. His students were his daughter's age. They completed science experiments where nothing at all was in play, where no possible outcome could surprise. Lately, this depressed him profoundly, and he didn't know why. Whenever Anna came to stay, she brought with her a bundle of drawings tied with string, all the work she'd done since they'd last seen each other, which she turned over to her father with great ceremony for critique. Unlike his old friends, unlike himself, his daughter was not pretending. She was an artist. In that honest way, only children can be, and this fact filled Henry with immense pride. They would sit on his couch and discuss in detail her works of crayon and pencil and pastel, color, composition, stroke, theme. Henry would put on his most elegant, most highfalutin accent and describe her work with big words she did not understand but found delightful, funny, and very grown up. Post-structuralist, antediluvian, proto-surrealist, aphasic. She'd smile and he'd rejoice. The anthropomorphic strain running through your work is simply remarkable. <laughs> More often than not, hidden within his daughter's artwork, Henry found a terse note from Anna's mother which was, in content and tone, the exact opposite of Anna's light-hearted drawings, a list of things to do, reminders about Anna's school fees, activities, appointments, words free of warmth or affect, or any trace of the life they had once attempted to make together. The playfulness would cease for a moment as Henry read. What does it say, Daddy? Anna would ask. Your mother. She says she misses me. <laughs> Henry and his daughter would dissolve into fits of deep-throated laughter. For a girl her age, Anna understood divorce quite well. <laughs> the revival of Henry's most famous play was timed to coincide with the 15th anniversary of its truncated debut and the 20th anniversary of the founding of the company. When he told Anna's mother the idea, she congratulated him. Maybe you can get locked up again, his ex-wife said. Perhaps it will resurrect your career. <laughs> A similar notion had crossed his mind too, of course, but for the sake of his pride, Henry pretended to take offense. Now, at the auditions, his career felt farther away than ever. Whatever this was, whether a vice, an obsession, a malady, it most certainly was not a career. Still, this dialogue, these lines he'd written so many years before, even when recited by these inexpert actors, provoked in Henry an unexpected rush of sentiment, memories of hope, anger, righteousness, the high drama of those days, a sense of vertigo, he pressed his eyes closed. In prison, Rogelio had taught him how to place a metal coil in the carved out grooves of a brick and how to use this contraption to warm up his meals. Before that simple lesson, everything Henry ate had been cold. The prison was a frightful place, 
the most terrifying he'd ever been. He tried his hardest to forget it, but if there was anything about those times that had the ability to make him shudder still, it was the cold, his stay in prison, the fear, his despair reduced to a temperature, cold food, cold hands, cold cement floors. He remembered now how these coils had glowed bright and red, how Rogelio's smile did too, and was surprised that these images moved him so. For their part, the actors were mostly too nervous or excited to notice Henry's un sorry. For their part, the actors were mostly too nervous or excited to notice Henry's troubled, uneasy countenance, or if they did, they assumed it was in response to their own performances. Some, it should be noted, had no idea who he was. But Nelson did recognize Henry. He heard him on the radio that day, and not long after decided to become a playwright. All these years later, and in many ways, it remained his dream. So what did he say to Henry? Something like, Mr. Nunez, it's an honor, or I never thought I'd have the chance to meet you, sir. The words themselves aren't that important. That he insisted on approaching the table where Henry sat, absorbed in dark memories, was enough. Picture it. Nelson reaching for his hero's hand, his eyes brimming with admiration, a connection between the two men, the mentor and his protege. When we spoke, Henry dismissed this idea, but I insisted. Did the playwright see something of himself in this young man, something of his own past? No, Henry responded, and if you'll pardon my saying so, I was never ever that young, not even when I was a boy. No matter. On a Monday in March 2001, Nelson was summoned to rehearsals at a theater in the old city, a block off the traffic circle near the National Library, where his father had once worked. After a dismal year, a breakup, a protracted tenure at an uninteresting job, the disappointing aftermath of a graduation both longed for and feared, Nelson was simply delighted by the news. Henry was right. Nelson, almost 23, had a backpack full of scripts, a notebook jammed with handwritten stories, a head of unruly curls, and he seemed much, much younger. Perhaps this is why he got the part. His youth, his ignorance, his malleability, his ambition. The tour would begin in a month, and that is when the trouble began. Thank you.